Hi everyone, Dan Gunner from Insane Forensics. Welcome back to Tech Talk Tuesday. Today we're going to talk about proactive and reactive threat hunting and why you should switch from reactive threat hunting to proactive threat hunting. And this might be a new terminology you're used to, so we'll go through the difference between reactive and proactive threat hunting. And we'll talk about why it leads to actually catching more threats when your threat hunting is more proactive instead of taking a reactive approach. So hopping right into it. So, um, and obviously a lot of people, when I bring up this slide, they're going to suddenly click off because this is definitely a contentious topic to talk about um, when you're talking about threat hunting. But this is where, you know, the difference between being proactive and reactive really comes back to known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns, and unknown unknowns, um, and specifically what you look for during a threat hunt. Um, so starting at kind of what most people are familiar about, known knowns, right? These are known capabilities used by known threats. This is where threat intelligence is incredibly valuable, right? Because we can take threat intelligence directly into a threat hunt and say, hey, I'm going to search for APT29 or APT34 because I know the tools that they've used in the past. Um, and a lot of people will say, hey, you know, just, just worry about the known knowns, right? Um, so it's re really easy to sell known knowns as, hey, why worry about everything else? Um, you know, when you can just worry about th things here. And, you know, the focus of this talk is again to say, you know, why you should kind of move beyond known knowns. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is unknown knowns. Um, and so these are unknown threats using known capabilities, right? So if you take an APT29 tool and you say, hey, they use PS exec, hey, they use Mimi cats, right? You put that in your threat hunt. Well, while you're doing your threat hunt, if you're looking for you know, known capabilities, you might actually find an unknown threat doing this, right? Threat Intel marginally helped you here because you kind of accidentally found um, a threat um, you know, using known Intel. If it was a threat Intel based hunt, right? Um, you kind of accidentally did find that known threat just by looking at a capability that another threat uses. Um, again, the unknown is the fact that the threat is unknown and that's why it's on the bottom the bottom quadrant, um, and the capability is known. That's why it's on that right quadrant, right? Um, when you get into unknown knowns, right? These are unknown capabilities by known threats. Um, this is where it's very, very important to understand these, right? Because you know about the threat, um, but the fact is even with the you know perfect threat intel from the best source out there, from the best subscription you can pay for, um, this, you know, this box is always going to exist. You're not going to know about every capability that a threat has, particularly nation states, right? Because nation states literally spend millions and billions of dollars in counterintelligence and other things that prevent you from knowing exactly what you're looking for, right? Um, so in this case, again, known unknowns is when you don't know the capability the threat's going to use, um, but you do know the threat, right? Um, finally, unknown unknowns. Um, this is unknown capabilities by unknown threats. Um, this is a really hard one. Um, obviously, you know, this is one you luck into maybe uh, doing analysis and doing um, you know, different analysis techniques on here, but this is a row that you're unlikely to find during a threat hunt or that you find entirely by luck. Um, today, we're going to talk about black swan events. We'll jump into a little about what those are in the next slide, but when we talk about black swan events, um, black swan events, right, um, are going to exist when it's not a known known when you say like, hey, you know, it's kind of the margin of what we don't know that we're looking for in a threat hunt. So let's talk, let's jump into what black swan, or actually first let's say, okay, known knowns here, right? If you're looking for known knowns, your threat hunt is 100% reactive. And why it's reactive is you're waiting for threat intelligence to say, hey, if you care about this adversary, you need to look for this. If all of your threat hunting is for known knowns, you are doing 100% reactive threat hunting, and you're likely only going to find um, that intel that you're being react reactionary to. If you're looking for unknown knowns, technically you're kind of 50% reactive and 50% proactive, right? You're 50% reactive because you're looking for that known capability, but you're 50% proactive in this way because you could you know, potentially find an unknown threat looking for that capability, right? It's not the pure 100% reactive, 
Um, Cause again, like, uh, you know, it, it could again find that other threat. The 100% proactive is when you go to the left side of the um, capability um, of the X axis on the bottom and you're looking for, you know, unknown um, capabilities, right? Um, here you're 100% proactive, right? Because even if you know the threat, um, you're still assuming that, hey, the attacker is going to do research and development. The attacker is still doing development even when we haven't seen the tool yet or we haven't seen them use it. So, you know, again, when you look at this quadrant and when you talk about threat hunting, if you're looking for capabilities that are unknown, regardless of the threat is, you're definitely in that 100% proactive category, right? Because again, you don't have an Intel report saying that, you know, adversary X has this if you're looking for adversary X, right? So hopping into black swan theory that we talked about. So, you know, there was this saying back in by a second century Roman poet, you know, a rare bird upon the mo earth, most like a black swan. Um, and this saying actually survived literally, you know, almost 2000 years or, you know, a thousand and a half years there. Um, until a Dutch explorer actually found out, hey, there are black swans in Western Australia. For a while in the Roman Empire, they didn't think there were black swans. Um, and the point here isn't to try to predict um, events that are unknown, but the point of the black swan theorem and um, you know, um, Nassim Taleb, um, his theorem, the point of it is to create a robust ability to deal with unknowns when they hit you, right? Um, and we were talking about unknown, unknown, or unknown capabilities by known threats um, and all of that. And where the black swan theory specifically comes into this is these happen all the time in InfoSec, right? And by Taleb's theorem, um, the black, to meet the black swan theory, it has to ha meet three criteria. So the event has to be an outlier, right? So again, a lot of cyber stuff is going to be an outlier to this because you're saying, hey, I know the attacker but maybe use of an unknown tool, I think that's going to be an outlier because um, you know, for whatever reason, I think that an attacker is always going to use the same tool. That type of thought would make an attacker using a different capability an outlier there. Carries extreme impact, right? Um, you know, when, you're in, when your environment is impacted by an attacker or when, you know, whether it be ransomware or some other cause happens, um, hacking does have that extreme impact. Um, and finally, the third one, often, in spite of the outlier status, you know, it's easy to see after the fact, and we can almost say it's explainable and predictable, right? Um, if you take that back to the black swan theorem, right? Because in second century Rome, they had never seen black swans, they're just like, well, there aren't any black swans, right? Um, where the Dutch explorers were like, hey, there actually are black swans in Western Australia. And black swan events happen frequently in InfoSec. Um, you know, another quote from Talib here is consider that you're a turkey fed every day, right? Every feeding, you're like, hey, you know, I'm being taken care of. This is a great life. Um, human interest is looking after me. Um, the black swan event for that turkey, you know, is that week before Thanksgiving, right? Um, and that's where that turkey's belief is going to significantly change, right? Um, for a turkey, right? It's the same deal in info or, you know, as the beliefs of that changed and as kind of the known knowns of what that turkey belief changed, um, we, can, we can relate that over to InfoSec, right? Things like solar winds, things like the discovery of uh, MS-17010 and then seeing it used in WannaCry, things like, you know, safety system hacks, um, you know, really any ransomware event, right? Um, again, what we're looking for when we talk about black swans and InfoSec is, was it an outlier, right? Is this an own unknown, known unknown? Does it have extreme impact, right? Did it actually impact my environment? Were they able to get access? Were they able to, you know, carry out an action in my environment? Um, and is it explainable and predictable? And for most InfoSec events, it actually is, right? That's where you bring in the computer science and that's where you get into the um, kind of, has it happened in the past versus is it theoretical? If it's theoretical, it's explainable and predictable, right? Um, so this is where entirely reactive threat hunting um, is going to lead to a major vulnerability in your threat hunting program um, because of the limitations of threat intel, right? Threat intel can only report on known knowns, right? Um, in a lot of cases. And 
some might argue, well, they can report on the use of a capability and say, well, you know, with this activity group cluster, we don't really know who's behind it, right? Um, but nonetheless, you have a cluster and you have a capability being reported on there. So, you know, the point here is to say that you need to think about, hey, is my threat hunting just reactive? Um, or am I actually getting proactive here, right? And how can I change that? So again, you know, this is where the possible versus probable, right? And a lot of people will talk about this also, and they'll say, well, that's theoretical, right? Um, and you know, you're, again, if you think about it this way, if you think about kind of the top area of this, right? If we're in the possible and probable side, you know, it's not an outlier. Um, it's a legitimate threat, right? These are things that we should worry about um, because it's both possible to do in my environment, it's possible to have an impact with, and for whatever reason, I think it's probable, right? If we take an event and we say, okay, well, this event is probable, but it's not possible, that event's going to be FUD, right? And you're wasting money and you definitely don't want to threat hunt for those events. Um, if it's not possible and it's not probable, same deal. Um, you know, if you're getting sold on events that are not possible and probable or not possible and not probable, then people are basically selling you fixes for a problem you don't even have. Um, but the other thing we really need to worry about here are the events that are possible and not probable. Because again, like, right, if you're only going for known knowns, you're only looking for things that are possible and probable. If you're looking for, you know, capabilities um, that exist out there and you're saying like, hey, this capability isn't tied to a group. Well, you're saying it's possible, but it's not probable. So it might not be in a threat, a threat hunt, right? So if it's not in a threat hunt and you're like, hey, I'm not going to look for APT29 or 34 using that, then your threat hunting might be proactive and because you're saying, hey, you know, that's not going to happen in this case, so I don't care about it yet. Um, so again, like where possible and probable is equally important is again, at the end of the day, if it's possible and you're saying it's not probable, it's still a threat to you. So again, uh, you know, this is why when you're doing threat hunting, you should do proactive threat hunting because you know you don't just want to react to hey we finally saw an attacker do this um, possible versus probable from the technology perspective um, is a very very important thought exercise for talib's criteria so finally kind of what you can take from this talk so how do we start finding black swans how do we get um, you know out of kind of being completely reactive to threat intel and how do we look for kind of the N plus one, the you know day plus one of what an attacker is actually using, right? Um, first, you should start adding known unknowns um, to your threat hunting program, right? So known adversaries using you know capabilities we didn't know they previously used, right? Um, these known capabilities, why you want to start here is these are capabilities that can be modeled and hunted for. So this is something that's immediately actionable. Um, and something you want to con con um, consider with this is start with capabilities where the attacker has low adoption friction. Um, and pop these are popular tools, right? So a lot of people will say, well, you know, we think there's a lot of friction to an attacker actually being able to start using this tool. Um, there's often a lot of big assumptions there. A lot of techniques and a lot of capabilities when you look at MITRE ATT&CK, um, they can just be a single command line. Um, so the actual implementation of it is not that difficult, right? Um, and once you start with those like low adoption friction, popular tools, you know, move up to the harder ones, move up to the ones that, hey, maybe, you know, people aren't using this as much. We don't think they'll actually do this, um, but start with kind of those easy wins, the low hanging fruit there. Example of some of those tools, right? Are things like law bins, right? Um, living on the land binaries. There's really good sites out there. If you Google for, for them, we'll probably do a video on it sometime later. Things like PS exec and Pi installer, right? We've seen Pi installer used in quite a few major nation state campaigns. So if Pi installer is not in your threat hunt, maybe you add it because we're already seeing like APT29 is doing it. I think a few of the other major APT groups are doing it. Um, and again, things like Mimi Cats, right? Um, you might find your red team, but a lot of APTs are also doing that too. So, you know, first thing you can do again is start adding the known unknowns. Once you do that, start thinking about the unknown knowns, right? Um, 
the more known capabilities you search for, um, you know, the better chance you have of catching an unknown threat using known uh, known tools, right? Um, the point of this again is to think as you hunt, like, hey, we're going to look for a known capability such as PS exec. Um, and our mind isn't just going to be focused on, hey, let me look for APT 34. It's going to be, hey, let me start doing threat hunts on, you know, some of the tools that are commonly used by these groups, right? And pivot out from maybe doing a threat focused threat hunt to kind of a capability focused set threat hunt. Make sure you aren't wearing blinders during your hunt for discovering these. So again, where we're wrapping up and what the point of this talk is to say, hey, consider looking not just at your known knowns and being reactive, but get proactive and look at your known unknowns and your unknown knowns. So thanks for joining in this week. It was great having you. We hope to have you back next week and thanks a lot.